How's it going and welcome to my guide on how to handle chapters 3 and 4 of the 5th edition module Rime of the Frost Maiden. In this video I will be taking a deep dive into how you can handle a particular event that happens in between chapters 3 and 4 here. But before I can go into actual names or anything fancy, I must warn you that there will be spoilers. So people that actually plan on playing on this adventure, do not watch this because this is spoilerino territory. But if you are a DM who's looking for some added insight, I would highly recommend you stay put because we have a lot to go into. Alright, now that we're here, let's go ahead and dive into what I'm talking about. I am talking about a particular dragon that pops out and destroys the Ten Towns. I have so beautifully rendered these crappy drawn arrows onto these towns to show you all basically how the dragon flies. It flies out of Sunblight, then all the way to Dugan's Hole, then to Goodmead, and etc, etc, and it makes this circle all around, hitting Bryn Shander last, whereupon it will finally return to Sunblight. The only thing that really sticks out in most people's minds is the math behind this. So, if you run it purely as written, what we discover here is that the dragon makes its way to the towns, far, far quicker than your players possibly could. So thankfully, we do get a pretty good graph here on how the dragon operates. We get this large info dump on how the dragon will fly to the town, and then you scroll down a little bit, and then we get this information on the target, the casualties, the damage sustained to the dragon, and how long it stays there, and that's the important part. So a perfect example here is, we can see that from Sunblight to Dugan's Hole, it takes two hours. And once it is at Dugan's Hole, it spends 30 minutes where after it goes ahead and leaves to the next town. And then from Dugan's Hole, it goes to Goodmead, and it only takes 30 minutes. And then at Goodmead, it takes a whole one hour to mop up the town. And this process continues and continues and continues. Sadly, we don't get a graph on how much time it takes overall. You do have to combine the things, so you have to remember, all right, from Sunblight to Dugan's Hole, it takes two hours, and then, you know, etc., etc. You got to do that math yourself. But as we'll see right this second is the fact that this math just doesn't add up. So your players finally crest these mountains and they're on the opposite side and they're looking all about and they see this fortress and they see this dragon fly out. And one, they don't exactly know what this dragon is if they didn't interact with the Durgar previously. If they specifically didn't get the information that there is in fact a weapon of some kind and it will destroy the Ten Towns. It is very likely that your players run through this module and don't have that thrust upon them. That information is just not there. Unless of course you give it to them, which I highly recommend you foreshadow something. But if they don't get any information at all, then all of a sudden they just see a dragon pop out of this place. And they're probably more than likely going to say, hey... You know, that dragon just left? That's perfect time for us to go in there and fight some Durgar. That sounds awesome. But if your players have been tipped to the fact that this Chartland dragon is in fact headed to the Ten Towns, your players might be incentivized to go ahead and head back. But here is where the math sucks. So your players are at good old Sunblight. They're right at the crest. They've climbed all this way. They've went around all these mountains. So let's go ahead and see. The dragon hops out of Sunblight and then flies all the way to Dugan's Hole in the span of two hours. So, as your players make their way down, they meet Velen Harpel, who just so happens to have enough sleds for everyone. And you guys hop on these sleds with this woman you've never met before and all of a sudden race back to the Ten Towns. So, we start our adventure right here. Oh, look at that. Oh, zoop, zoop. You zoop all around. And... It's maybe 18 miles. You know, let's go ahead and try and cut a corner here. You know, let's make it like a solid 17-ish miles. Uh, you know, for, for let's just go ahead and cut all the corners possible, and let's say that is 17 miles. So on dog back, on sled, 17 miles is 17 hours of travel. So as we can already tell, Dugan's Hole is screwed. But more importantly is the fact that more than just Dugan's Hole is screwed because, you know, who cares about Dugan's Hole, right? It's the fact that these other towns are just ruined. And just for quick reference here, we can see that after 17 arduous hours, your players finally make it to Dugan's Hole. 
and look how long it takes the good mead. It takes a whopping two hours to get there, which the dragon could have already covered by leaps and bounds. So once you start going through the mental hurdle of adding up all these time zones here of how long it takes the dragon to fly and how long it takes on destroying these towns, we quickly discover the fact that your players are not going to be able to save the majority of 10 towns. In fact, it is far more likely that if you run it purely as rules is written, the 10 towns are pretty much screwed and you can maybe hold up at Bryn Shander. So is this how it is supposed to be intended? Are the towns just supposed to be destroyed with you actually not being able to physically do anything? I mean, as per written, yes, sadly, as per written, you can't make it to any of the 10 towns nearly fast enough. And even more so, if you do somehow cut corners and make your way to a town before the dragon arrives, as written, it states that the dragon, after it takes a decent amount of damage, it'll just go ahead and fly off to the next town, where it'll be able to fly to the town quicker than your players will be able to travel to it. But I could go on all day about talking about this. I think a graph is in order, and for this, I'll be busting out a map that the wonderful person in the community, Maddie, drew up. Maddie has this awesome chart, which is driven by the community, but thankfully is presented for us. So let's go ahead and turn over to that, shall we? As we can see here, we are given several options on how we can run down this encounter. But of course, I'll be going ahead and adding some flair of my own and some possible other solutions that we could throw in the mix. The first thing on our list here is the PCs can't or don't save any of the towns, which is seems to be as written by the authors because, man, your players just won't be able to mush their way all the way to chase down a dragon who is soaring around all over the place and jacking up everything. And of course, what's very important to note here is if your players don't know the dragon's path at all, then they might think that the dragon might act erratically or they might think that it has a certain path in motion which you know is the opposite of what they're thinking they might be thinking it's going clockwise instead of counterclockwise and they just show up to the wrong place and then they sit there and they just see nothing because the dragon just doesn't show up this is the solution that i would go ahead and recommend if you are running a grim dark setting where you're okay with killing all of the npcs that your players have gotten to know and love i would recommend this setting if you want to run it completely rules as written and be an absolute rules lawyer and i would recommend doing it this way if you just love sowing heartbreak and misery into your players However, I personally would not recommend running it purely like this because I think that your players should at least have somewhat of a chance. So let's go ahead and dive into that, shall we? The second option listed here is PCs can help only a few towns, which is likely as intended by the authors. And for that, we get several options on how this could be possibly done. Velen, instead of showing up with dog sleds, she could be showing up with undead dog sleds or axe beaks, which would allow for faster travel. And this would allow your players to march on further and go faster over the plains. And this would allow your players to actually go to some of the locations, possibly a little bit earlier. The second option here is hack the dragon. Simply cut down on its flight path and make it just go slower because... The amount of time it takes for it to go to any of the towns is quite frankly ridiculous. Your players will never be able to catch up to it because, you know, it is mechanically faster because it is a dragon. But, of course, you can do such things as make it take a little longer in the blizzards. And you can make it, of course, maybe not fly for extended periods of time. Or maybe it just zigzags instead of going in a straight line the whole time. In our third option listed here is Sunblight has underground tunnels, perhaps with some underground rivers, into town outposts that allow for less snowy travel. And this would allow, of course, for your players to just march faster and hopefully get to any town a little bit quicker. You could say that the Duragar were building an extremely vast tunnel network leading all the way to East Haven, and they actually had a river flowing through there that is kept heated by the thermal vents and is actually a flowing river and would allow for very quick travel via canoe. You could have an awesome minecart that takes them all the way to Kerr Conig and Kerr Dinavel. You could have so many different things here that are underground, which would allow your players to not have to deal with the cold for once, which would be awesome. 
You could have your players just sit back and relax for an extended period of time and then eventually pop up on wherever it is that they appear and et cetera, et cetera. Any one of these or a combination of them would allow your players to at least show up to some of the 10 towns and possibly help them out. But of course, your players might not be able to save all of the 10 towns. And that is, of course, specifically looking at Dugan's Hole. But once again, no one cares about Dugan's Hole. And your players will maybe even have to make the choice of, oh, hey, you know, we know the dragon's fast. Maybe we should go ahead and, you know, go five towns up and say, screw the rest. For our third option in the possibilities of saving 10 towns, we have the PCs can help all slash most of the towns. And here we get some very awesome options. First up, we have Hall of the Prototypes. Prototype Dragon slash Flyer is uncovered in Sunblight to chase and fight the dragon in each town. So your players say, you know what, we don't know about the dragon, let's go ahead and dive into Sunblight. Your players hack and slash the way through and eventually they find another dragon or possibly some flying device which would allow them to quickly go over the mountains and to the towns. And now armed with this flying device, whether it be a helicopter of some kind or maybe some dragon that's hollowed out, your players are able to make it all the way to the 10 towns quick and put a stop to that evil Chartland dragon. Next up, we have Chewinga's Charm of the Snow Walker. Allows easy travel for the sleds, potentially, plus a shortcut to East Haven. So you could obviously have this really cool thing where your players make their way down, Vel and Harpel greets them, then all of a sudden a couple of Chewingas pop up and slap everyone with some awesome power, and all of a sudden they just start zooming across the snow. They go faster than they've ever been. And you could totally have this fun thing where your players are like, you know, they have to close their eyes and squint as they're, you know, just getting cold air in there but they're just zooming across the the snow like they've never done before and are able to make it to the towns quickly all the meanwhile far off in the distance they see this glowing figure flying and they know they got to beat that thing to the towns pcs have an alternative form of quick travel wind walk flying mounts fly etc so of course this could be your players show up and maybe the Chewingas go ahead and slap the players with some magic and they can do wind walk. They can go ahead and have some Goliaths show up and these Goliaths give some griffins that your players are able to ride and they're able to zoom through the skies. And maybe Velen and a cabal of mages goes ahead and slaps everyone with some fly spells. And that way they can fly and at the same time not have to worry about losing concentration. You can totally have this epic moment where your players are flying across the sky and are totally duking out with a dragon. Or they just go ahead and fly quickly to the town and get into an epic fight, you know, and your players are looking like Tinkerbell going up against Captain Hook, essentially. And now for a really badass option... Arveaturus slows the Chartland dragon. Maybe Arveaturus is flying around and all of a sudden sees another dragon and realizes, hey, I don't like rivals, screw this. And then all of a sudden we have this kaiju battle in the skies. We have Arveaturus in one corner and a metallic Chartland dragon in the other. And that would be so cool. That'd be Godzilla versus Mechagodzilla, but with wings and in the sky. That's awesome. Mind you, though, if you do this, you have to consider, do you want Arveaturus to just completely destroy the Chartland Dragon? Or do you want there to be simply some wounding and Arveaturus backs off and then the dragon has been slowed down and weakened significantly so that your players can go ahead and do the finishing blow? Because, quite frankly, your players finishing this thing off is way cooler than just watching some fight go on. And the last option listed here is Velen shows up on giant eagle mounts and you will totally have memes for days about Lord of the Rings and why the eagles didn't show up. All of those options are awesome, but mind you, if your players do still don't act quickly enough or if they, you know, choose incorrectly, they will lose a town or two, which once again is perfectly fine if they lose a town or two, but this at least lets them save a decent chunk of the towns. For our fourth entry in Saving the Ten Towns, we have the PCs can completely save some towns. The first up being, PCs are high enough level to actually deal with it. So as we can see here, your players are supposed to be 6th level when they go ahead and fight the dragon. The thing about it is though, 6th level is really not that great. You know, at 6th level you're not hitting any capstone, you're not really hitting anything special. So being 6th level really isn't that much better than being 5th level. 
And unfortunately, this Chartland Dragon is kind of crazy to be fighting at 6th level. So you could just go ahead and say, you know, screw it. You guys are 7th level or maybe even 8th level when you go ahead and fight the Chartland Dragon. And mind you, 7th and 8th levels are in a way higher league of their own compared to 5th and 6th. So bumping up the level of your players will certainly lead to an edge where they can go ahead and knock down that dragon real quick. Another option we have here is PCs can trick Arveaturus to engage the dragon, or they can go ahead and disable the dragon remotely from Sunblight. So your players could go ahead and somehow convince Arveaturus that, oh hey, that dragon is the one that's killing your kids. Oh hey, that dragon's stepping up on your territory. And your players could go ahead and fight alongside Arveaturus and fight this Chartland dragon. Mind you, if you take this approach, you're probably going to want to go ahead and buff the Chartland dragon's health to some degree, because my oh my, can a ancient dragon put out some damage. And once again, I'll go ahead and recommend that Arveaturus gets injured to some degree and backs off and then leaves your players to deliver that finishing blow, and that'll be super epic and awesome. But in regards of disabling the dragon, you could go ahead and say that somewhere in the forge, maybe the king's got it on his person, maybe it's in his throne room, maybe it's in the forge, it could be something, but it could just be a big red button that says do not push, and if your players push it, then the Chartland dragon shuts down, or maybe it automatically heads back to town. And last for options here, we have flight power for the dragon can be disabled from Sunblight which would mean that its travel speed goes from ridiculously high to next to nothing. And that would be really cool. Your players go ahead and dive into Sunblight, deal with the Durgar there, they slam another big red button, and this big red button says that the dragon loses its wings, and then all of a sudden there's this dragon that's now crawling its way across the frozen tundra trying to get to the towns. That would be awesome because your players can eventually find the trail that the dragon is leaving, and are able to you know go ahead and follow that and they can totally catch up to it and have an epic fight with a dragon and they won't have to deal with the bs of dragons being able to fly and you know just strafe all the time those options are incredibly awesome and allow your players to actually the opportunity to save all of the 10 towns should they actually go for it once again dugan's hole is relatively close by and is still probably going to get bushwhacked but the other towns, maybe Goodmead and maybe even East Haven, will be spared this destruction. And finally, the fifth option we have here for saving the 10 towns is PCs can completely save all the 10 towns. And this is probably the one you want if you are running a game where it's sunshine and rainbows and your players love happy endings. And for this one, we get two pretty simple options here. PCs are high enough level to stop the dragon as soon as it's launching out. As, instead of the dragon just looking at the players roaring and flying it down, it engages the party right at the gates of Sunblight, and your players are able to deal with it no issue. Once again, this is probably better if your players are a little bit higher level, but also very important to note is if they are armed with the Horn of Blasting. If your players went to the Yarlmoot and were able to retrieve the Horn of Blasting and use it on this creature, they're going to do a bejesus ton of damage. This thing is going to be pumping out so much damage that it's going to make that poor wizard that casts Fireball look like a chump. So if your players are higher level, or maybe even if they're only lower level, but maybe have an NPC or two on the side and have this Horn of Blasting, they will be able to dunk on that poor, poor Charlin Dragon. It's not going to know what hit it, especially when that raging barbarian or fighter rushes up and just blows away this creature. And the last option listed here on Maddie's Beautiful Guide is skip chapter 4 entirely. The dragon isn't finished and is still being worked on the forge. If you do this, then what that means is your players show up to Sunblight they take a look around and then they will be able to see this dragon being worked on by these Duragar. And they can go ahead and say, hey, you know, if we don't stop this, then this dragon is going to go ahead and destroy the Ten Towns. We need to act right now. And that is really cool incentive to get your players to actually going to the place that they were going to and actually fighting the foe that they're intended to. So with all these options in mind, the skies are the limit. Or maybe in the dragon's case, not if you go ahead and disable its wings. But at the end of the day, you have to consider which option is best for your table and best for your players and probably best for yourself. You have to decide, are you trying to run this thing purely as written to try and get the actual experience that the book is intending? Are you going to adjust things so it looks like they have a glimmer of hope, but they lose it? 
Are you going to allow your players this option where they're able to save some of the 10 towns but not all? Are your players able to save the majority of the towns? Are your players able to save all the towns? Or do your players not even have to worry about the towns in danger at all? I cannot recommend any one way for you because fun is subjective. And I'm sure there's some players that would love seeing some towns destroyed but others saved and saying, yeah, we did it. We, we stopped it from, you know, getting to all the good towns. And I'm sure there's a lot of players that will be devastated if some of their towns are destroyed. They're going to say, oh, you know, we had some really great friends in there and that's where I grew up. And, you know, maybe I was the speaker of that town. There's a lot of ways your players are going to react to the destruction of 10 towns. So while I personally can't recommend any one of these options for your table, I'm sure you're probably already getting some things cooked up in your mind in regards of how you want to handle it. Because once again, this is one of the major upsets of this module. A lot of people are reading through and seeing, oh man, the 10 towns just get destroyed. That sucks. So go ahead and implement any one of these options. So of course we've got some really great options here and they range from your players just being able to move faster or move underground or maybe you know a foreign entity goes ahead and helps them out. We get a ton of options here but of course more can always be appreciated. So let's go ahead and discuss some other ways your players could go ahead and tackle this ferocious Charlin dragon. If you don't like the idea of your players having to travel all the way back to 10 towns, you know, going over all the snow and the mountains and whatever else, then you could just go ahead and have Velen, as she shows up, say, hey, I'm glad I caught up to you. I want to go ahead and teleport us back to 10 towns. Simple as that. You could just have Velen, you know, wave her hand and everyone teleports all the way back to whatever town you desire. And just like that, you're there. Problem solved. Maybe you want your players to arrive back in town in style. You could go ahead and have some goblins show up and these goblins have polar bears that are driving forth a battle cart and your players can go ahead and be part of this battle cart and that is rampaging through the snow and that would be cool. Heck, you could even turn this into an on-rail shooter and have a turret strapped to the battle wagon and your players are in this wagon that's being pulled by polar bears and you guys are shooting out at this dragon and the dragon's flying around and it's about to go ahead and attack the cart. That could certainly be interesting. Another possibility is the fact that your players are not alone in the endeavor to save the ten towns. There seems to be a certain devil that's floating around this place that has a ton of followers and maybe that devil doesn't want all of his followers getting killed. Maybe Levistus goes ahead and orders all of his cultists to come out in the open and form a solid force and put a stop to the Chartland dragon. Maybe the cultists combine in a sort of ritual that is able to bind the dragon to the earth and maybe even damage the dragon to some degree. Heck, maybe this cultist ritual could even provide a sort of opportunity against the, the Charlin Dragon by removing one of its resistances or by giving it vulnerability to a certain damage type. Who knows? And lastly, the big one. This one I've seen floating around all over the place. People are talking about it. I even thought about it for a little bit. Is the fact that there is an alien spaceship that is nestled not too far away from Sunblight. We have actually not too far away the It Ascendant. Your players could go ahead and make their way to the It Ascendant and all of a sudden discover that the ship is fully operational and your players can go ahead and fly this thing out and fight the dragon in the skies, not only in an alien spaceship, but also armed with alien weaponry. Now whether the gnome ceramorphs are piloting this thing or if your players have already killed them and dealt with them and your players go ahead and drive this thing on their own doesn't really matter but what really matters is the fact that you could have a cool alien spaceship duking it out with a made up dragon over the skies. That would be awesome. There is of course just no end to the possibilities on how you can go ahead and handle the destruction of the 10 towns, whether it is completely destroyed or not destroyed at all. But something I haven't actually discussed yet and something a lot of people are considering is the fact that does it need to be a dragon? The reason why these Duragar built a Charlin dragon is because it's able to fly. But, you know, it doesn't need to fly. What if the Durgar go ahead and build a just giant mecha machine that is piloted by, who knows, maybe like a crew of 20 Durgar, and this thing goes ahead and stomps its way across the tundra? 
Instead of your players going into this with the motif of it being a dragon, your players can see the full extent of Duragar technology and magic in the guise of a Duragar mecha. If you are going to go ahead and change the dragon to a mech, then you can go ahead and play around with the stat block as well. Maybe instead of a large beam that shoots in a straight line, it goes ahead and shoots out in a cone in front of it. Instead of giving it wings, you can go ahead and give it extra arms and it gets more attacks in melee. I'm sure a lot of people are thinking about ways that they can go ahead and change the dragon into some other entity, whether it be, you know, a giant mech, or maybe it is just a superpowered Durgar in itself, or maybe it's a corrupted dragon that has been infused with Chartalin. There's a lot of ways you can go ahead and handle this, and it doesn't need to be just the Chartalin dragon. Because unfortunately, a lot of players have been spoiled by the fact that there is a dragon because of the D&D Beyond, you know, logos that are going out there with, the, you know, the dragon going ahead and shooting its radiant beam. So if you have players that have been spoiled to do that fact and you don't want players metagaming it and you don't like the fact that they already know, then I would suggest go ahead and just slap a new skin to it, but pretty much keep it the same. I would love to go ahead and just sit here and just brainstorm how you can handle this dragon and maybe whatever you change the dragon to be, but unfortunately there's only so much time in the world. Go ahead and brainstorm with yourself and brainstorm with the community. Go ahead and talk it out because this is not something you want to just throw in willy-nilly and don't think about the consequences. The ramifications of what happens here are pretty large. If the 10 towns are destroyed, what happens to all the people? Are they just homeless now? If half of the towns are destroyed, is there now a power vacuum that some of the 10 towns try to exploit? If the dragon does get to certain towns, are some of your players' favorite NPCs killed? You know, there's just so many things you got to consider with this chapter. It's a pretty significant deal in this campaign, and this really does ramp up the tensions in the campaign. So don't sleep on this information. Definitely keep into consideration and think to yourself how you want this campaign to shake up, both for your player's immediate future and for the future to come. In my Chapter 3 review, where I delve into Sunblight in particular, I will go ahead and be going over the specific locations where you can go ahead and slap those big red buttons that stop the dragon remotely. With that information, you should totally be able to handle your players skipping out on fighting the dragon and heading into Sunblight and hopefully stopping or at least stalling the dragon there. And that's going to do it for this video. Go ahead and tell me, how are you going to handle Chapter 4? Because I think, once again, this is going to be one of those things where every single DM is going to handle it in their own supremely unique way, which I really appreciate. Obviously, if you run it as written, then, you know, things are going to happen the way that they are. But I'm willing to bet that a lot of DMs are going to go ahead and take the reins on this one and truly make it unique. I want to know how you are handling it, and I want to know how it got handled. I want to know how your players actually responded to the destruction of Ten Towns. And I want to know what was the consequences of it, because I love reading all this stuff. I keep harping on this, but there's no wrong way to do it. Go ahead and play with it how you desire. Run it as written, you know, allow for some towns to exist, allow for all the towns to be saved. Maybe mix it up, you know, go ahead and be creative with this. Go ahead and shake things up because, and while you're shaking things up, why don't you go ahead and shake that like button and that subscribe button because 31% of my viewers are subscribed to me and I want that number to go just a little bit higher, just a little bit, and then I'll be happy. But that's going to do it for me. Thank you all for watching and I can't wait to see you all in the next one.